So first and foremost, we want to wish all the moms and grandmas a uh, very happy Mother's Day. And also acknowledge that Mother's Day is difficult for a number of people. Um, there are people who um, didn't have loving mothers. Uh, some people didn't have any mother. Others had abusive mothers. Um, others had mothers that were, uh, you know, addicted to substances. And, um, and then there are people who wish they could be mothers and haven't been able to for whatever reason. Um, so it's a difficult time for some. Um, so we, you know, just acknowledge that and acknowledge that regardless of where you are in life and what the circumstances are, uh, God loves you very much. And for those of you that are moms and grandmas, we are so blessed uh, by you and your presence. And I need to stop doing that. Um, okay, so here we go. We are a simple gathering of followers of Jesus. And our desire is to know and love and serve Jesus more fully. That's why we're here. We're going to look at Hebrews chapters 8 and 9 today. And just as a way of review, remember that the book of Hebrews has two primary goals. First, to convince us of Jesus' superiority. And second, to exhort us to be faithful in difficult times. Those exhortations come periodically throughout the book. The last three chapters are uh, pretty much nothing but exhortation to be faithful, uh, even in difficult times. So by way of outline, the first three verses, Jesus is Yahweh incarnate. He is God in human flesh. Chapters one and two, we saw that Jesus is uh greater than angels. He's greater than any message that angels could bring. His message is far superior to the Old Testament message in the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. In chapters three and four, we saw that Jesus is a better deliverer than Moses, and he's leading us to a better place than where Moses led the children of Israel. In chapters 5, 6, and 7, we saw that Jesus is superior to any other priest or priesthood. And then in chapters 8 through 10, we won't be able to get through all of that today. But in 8, 9, and 10, uh, the theme is that Jesus is greater than the sacrifices, and the new covenant is greater than the old covenant. And then, as I mentioned, the last three chapters are an exhortation to follow Jesus. So we dive right in with Hebrews chapter 8, where we're introduced to a new and better covenant. The author of Hebrews says, now the main point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary, and the true tent that the Lord, not any mortal, has set up by tent. He's referring there to the tabernacle that Moses built in the uh, book of Exodus. They offer worship in a sanctuary that is a sketch and shadow of the heavenly one. He's talking about the current Jewish priests who were offering sacrifices uh, no longer in the tabernacle, but now in the uh, temple in Jerusalem. And he says that that sanctuary is a sketch and shadow of the heavenly one. But Jesus has now obtained a more excellent ministry, and to that degree, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on the basis of better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need to look for a second one. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall not teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. 
for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Uh, verses 8 through 12, uh, the author of Hebrews is quoting from Jeremiah 31. And what a beautiful promise, isn't it? Uh, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. Everybody's going to know the Lord. I'll be merciful toward their iniquities. I'll remember their sins no more. God somehow has the ability to erase his own eternal mind, at least to take something out of it, not erase the whole thing, of course. So the present um, the, the present rituals that were going on at the time that Hebrews was written, the sacrifices in the temple, all those lambs and goats and uh, bulls and all the incense and all the ritual that was going on. The author of Hebrews says that is a sketch and shadow of reality. And really, Everything around us is a sketch and shadow of reality. We, we go through life thinking that this world that we experience through our five senses is, is, is what is real. And, and it is real, of course. Um, but it, it's real in the same sense that a shadow is real. And there is something beyond it that is much more real. And that's the heavenly realm. That's the throne room of God. It's the presence of God. It's what we tend to call heaven most of the time. It's what we think of when we um, think of a believer dying in Christ and going to be with the Lord. Where did they go? And they don't go up there someplace. They don't fly off into outer space. Uh, but there's a heavenly realm that is it's right here and it's now and it's it it's there's a thin veil between us and the next life it, it's just that as we go through our daily lives we're not aware of it most of the time but once in a while god gives us a glimpse of it doesn't he you know it might be a a, a dying loved one who begins talking to people that have already gone home to be with the lord while they're still talking to you, and they're perfectly lucid. They're not hallucinating or anything. It's just that they've got one foot in each in each room, as it were. Or, or you know, it it might be just the the overwhelming sense of awe that comes to you when you're in an, an extraordinarily beautiful place. If you're watching the aurora borealis, or uh, you know, snorkeling in tropical waters, or uh, standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon. Uh, or it can be something as simple as a sunrise or a sunset or a bird song. Uh, or uh, the the love in a in a loved one's eyes, you know. Um, God puts things all around us to remind us that there's something else, there's something beyond, that the world we live in is a sketch and shadow of reality. So God has, through Christ, instituted a new covenant. Now, a covenant is an agreement between two parties. And the Old Testament, of course, was a covenant between God and the children of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the descendants of Jacob's 12 sons. Um, and therefore, that covenant fell apart not because of anything God did, but because of the sin of the people. But the new covenant, and I think this is important to grasp a hold of, is not a covenant between God and the church or God and Christians. It is a covenant between the persons of the Trinity. It's a covenant between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the new covenant is unbreakable. Therefore, the new covenant cannot fail because it's a covenant within the heart of God, and God can't fail. The new covenant is eternal. The new covenant, in the new covenant, the law of love is written on our hearts, and our lives are transformed slowly over time, doesn't happen all at once, 
They're transformed from the inside out. That's what we call discipleship or spiritual formation. And eventually, all the sins and all the shadows are gone forever, and we are in the presence of the Lord, and the presence of the Lord fills the entirety of creation. Now, as we've been talking about sacrifice, um, there's an, a, a really good example here of what theologians call progressive revelation. Um, and the question arises, why did God command animal sacrifices in the first place? In fact, why do sacrifices need to be made for sin? I mean, can't sin just simply be forgiven? There's, there's lots of instances in the Old Testament where God uh, forgave people. I mean, he forgave King David for uh, murder and adultery, and there weren't any sacrifices offered. It wasn't that God forgave him because David killed a whole bunch of sheep. Um, David confessed, and God forgave him. And in the New Testament, of course, Jesus goes around forgiving all sorts of people, and, and that was scandalous. People looked at Jesus, and they said, Who, who's this guy think he is? Only God can forgive sins. Well, they're right about that. He was God. He is God. Um, uh, having remorse for our sinfulness makes perfect sense. That's, that's a good thing. Uh, repentance, the word repentance means to change direction. That, that's a good thing. Well, we should make restitution if we possibly can when we've hurt others. But how does slaughtering a bunch of animals fit in? And yet, uh, back in the book of Leviticus, um, God commands that all these various animal sacrifices, you know, bulls and goats and sheep and such. Now, remember that the Levitical law was given in the time of Moses. Um, the Levitical law recorded there in the first five books of the Bible, especially in the book of Leviticus, um, where it has the description of all those various um, rituals and sacrifices and where the commandments are given to, you know, slaughter the lambs and the animals and the Passover and all that stuff. That was given in the time of Moses, which is very roughly uh, about 1,500 years before the birth of Jesus. Uh, King David's time is, again, very roughly, about 500 years later. So about 500 years after that law was given, we find scriptures like Psalm 51. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. And Psalm 40, sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. And then, uh, so that's, you know, somewhere around, very roughly, a thousand years before the birth of Jesus. Fast forward another couple hundred years, and you have the prophet Hosea saying, uh, speaking on, on uh, God's behalf, and through the prophet Hosea, God says, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And Jesus quoted that in Matthew 9. Go and learn what this means, he said to the religious leaders. I desire mercy not sacrifice. And then he added, for I have come to call the right, I have not come to call, call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So what's up with that? Over the course of roughly five centuries, did God completely change his mind? He started out by saying, I want you to, you're, you're going to have to go through all these rituals, and you're going to have to slaughter these animals, and um, and make sure you do it in the right thing, make sure they're without blemish and all that stuff. And then 500 years later, the, the followers of, of God are saying, God never wanted that to start with. God has no desire for any of that. So what's going on? Well, what's going on is what we call progressive revelation. What that means is 
is that um, God accommodates us. He comes down to our level to where we can understand what God is saying and what God is doing. And, and that's just being a loving God. Um, a, a good teacher accommodates the needs of her students. Every student's different. Everyone learns differently. Everybody, with very few exceptions, can learn. But um, we learn, different people learn differently. And, and so, um, you know, a good teacher, if she has time, and teachers are overwhelmed with too many students and not enough time and, and way not enough pay. Uh, we live in a world where basketball players get $35 million a year and teachers have to uh, buy school supplies out of their own pocket. It's crazy. But anyway, um, you know, I, uh, ideally, if a teacher has the, the time and the resources, um, he, he or she will find out where each student is and then take them from where they are to where they need to be in a way that they can understand it. That's accommodation. Um, and that's what God does. That's why in the uh, book of Genesis, for example, well, actually throughout the whole um, Old Testament, you have um, the, the universe described in terms of common ancient Near Eastern cosmology. Uh, everybody in the ancient Near East believed that the earth was a sort of oval-shaped flat island surrounded by waters, and that there was a hard dome over top of it, um, which kept the waters above from falling down <laughs> on, on the earth. And there were lights that were in the dome. Those are the stars. And the sun traveled across the sky and then through the underworld and then back across the sky each day. Everybody believed that. It wasn't because they were stupid. It was because, you know, telescopes hadn't been invented. And if you just go out with your naked eye and look at the world, it does look like that. Uh, it, it looks like um, it's a flat earth surrounded by water, you know. Um, well, of course, God know, knew all along that the earth is not that. He, he knew all about how everything works. <laughs> um, but had he described the earth in those terms, for instance, in modern astrophysical terms, um, nobody would have understood anything that he said. So God came down to their level and used language that they understood. Another example of accommodation is uh, Israel having kings. It's very clear in the Bible that God never wanted them to have a king. And they whined and complained and insisted. And finally, God said, all right, but you're going to regret it. And so he allowed them to have kings. But yet later on, God speaks as if having kings was his idea to start with. That's because God is coming down to the level of others. And so progressive revelation means that humankind over the centuries seeking God, I'm talking about godly people, not just humankind in general, but um, godly people over the centuries learned more and more about who God really is. God is so big, so glorious, so magnificent, so wise I mean, it would just, our minds would explode if God were just to reveal everything there is to reveal. Instead, he comes down to our level, meets us where we are, accommodates to us, and over the course of centuries, people, godly people, get to know God better and better. So, 1,500 years before Jesus was born, everybody in the ancient Near Eastern world was slaughtering animals to their gods. So God uses that to point towards Jesus. 500 years later, um, the prophets understand God better, and they say, they look back and say, now that, that was never 
really part of God's original plan. God, what God really wants is our hearts. And so this progressive revelation continues through the Bible until you get to Jesus, who is the full and final and complete revelation of who God is. Um, which brings up another question, and that is, uh, what about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross? I mean, clearly God did not want his people, Israel, to sacrifice other people. Um, he makes that clear in the law of Moses and all the way through. Um, the other ancient Near Eastern nations were doing that, as well as slaughtering all those animals. And God said, well, all right, we'll let you do the animals, but we're not, we're not, you know, we're not going to throw any virgins into the volcano. We're not doing that. But then Jesus comes and offers himself as a sacrifice. So how's that fit in? We know, of course, that he's the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world for our sins, for our iniquities. That, that much is certain. But the question arises, did God's justice require him to kill his own son so that he could forgive us? You know, there, there's this courtroom analogy that I used to use all the time. And uh, any analogy, be careful with any analogy, because every analogy breaks down at some point. You can always take an analogy and push it too far, and, and then you've pushed it out of the realm of truth. And what we used to teach people, and what I used to teach people, um. I use this courtroom analogy, not, not, uh, um, uh, and it's nothing that I made up, you know, it's been around for a long, it's been, actually, it's been around since, um, well, probably Aquinas and Calvin and those guys. Anyway, so the idea is here I am, I've sinned, so I'm on trial before God. And because of my sin, I deserve, according to these people, uh, to, in a, conscious state be tortured in never-ending fire forever. That's what's hanging over my head. And I'm on trial. God is the Father, is the judge. Uh, I have a lawyer, of course. That's the Holy Spirit. He's my advocate, and he's arguing on my behalf. But there's also a prosecuting attorney, and that, of course, is Satan. And Satan is pointing out the letter of the law and demanding what he calls justice. And so persuaded by that argument, God the Father is just about to pass sentence on me, declare me guilty. And there are angels around that are kind of like bailiffs in this courtroom, and they're going to haul me off and throw me into this lake of fire where I'm going to burn and be tortured forever. But just at the last moment, Jesus, who's just been in the audience, you know, he's uh, the, the son of the judge, so he's been observing this whole thing, and he jumps up and says, uh, Dad, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't pass judgment on him. Kill me instead. And so the father, the judge, says, okay. And so they torture and kill Jesus, and that somehow appeases the judge's wrath, and now he can let me go. What's wrong with that picture? Well, what's wrong with that picture is it's completely contrary to the nature of God. God is not mad at us. God is not willing for any to perish. He wants all to come to the knowledge of the truth. And when you read the Gospels, it's very clear that God the Father did not kill Jesus. Jesus willingly lay aside, laid aside his eternal glory, became a human being, and willingly, out of love, absorbed into himself all the sin and all the evil in the whole cosmos, past, present, and future. And that made him vulnerable and killable. And so, who killed Jesus? It wasn't God the Father. 
It wasn't the Jews. <laughs> Jesus was a Jew. It was Satan, but Satan can't kill people directly. He has to go through others. So Satan using empire combined with religious leaders killed Jesus. But what Satan did not know was that there's a mystery at the heart of creation. And when an entirely innocent person willingly sacrifices his life, the curse of sin is broken. One of the best descriptions of that, uh, or um, pictures of that, I think, is in the Chronicles of Narnia, where, you know, that... that uh, uh, Eustace has has sinned, and and the wicked witch is demanding his death, and Aslan offers himself up, and the wicked witch, who's the figure of Satan, kills Aslan, who's the figure of Jesus. But what happens? The stone table cracks, and the deep magic brings him back to life, and suddenly all of Narnia starts to change into springtime again, and uh, life and joy and peace come to the land and forgiveness and grace and mercy is there with the resurrected Jesus. Uh, that's a good that's a, that's a good picture of what went on when Jesus absorbed in himself all the sin and it it imploded within him. It killed him, but it couldn't hold him in the grave. So I, I just think that's something we need to remember. It's not God's not mad at you. God's not angry. You're, you know, um, Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. You're, you're a, like a wretched insect hanging over the fires of hell by a thread. And it's only God's mercy that he doesn't just flick you, flick you into the flame. You know, that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is one who forgives sin, who covers iniquity, who said, I will remember their sins no more. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. So keeping that in mind, we move into chapter 9, which is talking about the fact that the temple, which was still then standing in Jerusalem, the book of Hebrews was written before 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed by Titus and the Roman armies. Um, and the temple... Um, and of course, the author of Hebrews is writing to a Jewish audience, Jews who have received Jesus as their Messiah, and now they're being persecuted. Some of that persecution is coming from fellow Jews, and so they're tempted to, to go back to all the rituals, um, because it would make life easier for them. Um, if, if they acted like all the other people around there, then maybe folks would leave them alone. Um, but uh, the author of Hebrews says, no, don't do that. <laughs> and he describes the rituals and sacrifices that went on in the temple. Now, the, the temple was uh, built on the model of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a portable worship center, um, which Moses built. Uh, it's described in depth in the book of Exodus. And the, the tabernacle looked something like this picture on the left. Uh, it had this uh, fence of curtains that went around it. It had a gate, which was always on the east side. And you entered in through the gate, and you would come to a, um, a, a big um, altar here where animal sacrifices were um, burnt and offered to God. Uh, beyond that, there was what was called the laver, which is uh, a, a big brass bowl that was for ceremonial washing. And this area was called the outer court. And this is where the animals were slaughtered. And this is where the animals were offered up as sacrifices and so forth. If you were a priest, you could go into the, and if it was your turn, you could go into the holy place. You could go into this big curtain inside this tent, which was um, sitting at the back of the tabernacle. As you went in, it looked something like this um, picture on the right side of your screen. 
Uh, you entered in, coming in from the east, and on your left would be the menorah. On your right would be the table with a loaf of bread for each of the tribes of Israel, changed every day. Straight in front of you would be the altar of incense, where praises and prayers were offered up to God. If you were the high priest, and if it was the day of Yom Kippur, the great day of atonement, and if you had made all the ritual sacrifices for your own sin as well as the sins of the people, then you could go beyond the veil and into the most holy place, which contained the Ark of the Covenant, which was like a golden box that had a really fancy lid with uh, cherubim, angels, angelic beings carved on top of it, um, that the lid was called the mercy seat. And inside the Ark of the Covenant itself was a copy of the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai, Aaron's rod that budded, and a golden jar that contained some of the manna that fell from heaven. Now, I think you can already see that all of this is pointing towards Jesus. You, you come into the presence of God through the sacrifice of Christ. We are washed in the waters of baptism. We enter into the presence of God, where we recognize that Jesus is the light of the world. We see that Jesus is the bread of life. We offer our prayers and praises and worship to God uh, in thanksgiving. And when Jesus died on the cross, this big veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place, not in the tabernacle, but now in the temple, which was modeled after this, ripped from top to bottom. So we, we can actually come into the very presence of God to the mercy seat and dwell in the presence of God. Now, the Shekinah glory of God, going back to Moses' day, the Shekinah glory of God rose up from this mercy seat and spread out over the camp of Israel, which would have looked something like this picture. Um, so the most from the most holy place at night, there was a big pillar of fire, and it spread out over the camp. They, all the Jews, all three and a half million of them, or whatever there were, thereabouts, uh, were all camped around. And, and it was all very orderly. Each tribe had a designated place. And when they marched, they had a designated order and all. Um, and so this pillar of fire would spread out over the whole camp. To, they're in the desert. Keep them warm at night. Keep away predators. Uh, keep away... Uh, you know, wild animals, that kind of thing. In the daytime, this pillar of fire would change into a pillar of cloud and spread out over them. They're in the desert. They need shade from the heat. Um, and they, they always are to stay under the fire by night and the cloud by day. When it was time to move the camp, this glory of God, this fire by night or cloud by day, would begin to rise up. And Moses would go to a place where most of the people could hear him, and he would blow a trumpet, and he would sing, Rise up, O Lord. And uh, all the people would begin packing up their tents and their belongings. And then they would wait until this cloud in the daytime would start to move. And then they would just stay under it follow it wherever it went. And when it stopped, then they would camp again. That's all pointing to Jesus too. We're under the protection of Jesus. And our lives are secure and safe as long as we are staying under the shadow of his love. If we go running out here in the desert by ourselves, then that could cause some trouble. So the author of Hebrews says, when Christ came as high priest of the good things that have come, he entered once for all into the holy place. It's talking now about the holiest of all, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, he's referring to sacrifices from the book of Leviticus, 
sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God? Back in the time of Moses, they're slaughtering all these animals. The people are uh, sometimes <laughs> trying their best to follow God and uh, to be remorseful for their sins. And, and uh, you know, they're, 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 they're working with God the best that they can. Sometimes, other times they're really in rebellion against God. But, um, but anyway, if, if those sacrifices back then um, could um, purify them, their flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, God in human flesh, who through the eternal spirit offered himself, his whole being, to the point of death, offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will the blood of Christ purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So, dead works are our efforts to appease God or to win God's favor or to come to God on our own terms. Specific, specifically, the author of Hebrews is talking about the Old Testament rituals that some of his audience were tempted to go back and pick up again. He's saying those are dead works. Come just as you are, come to God through Christ, and he will accept you and welcome you with open arms. And as you gaze into the eyes of Jesus, you will be so overcome by the beauty and the love of God that you will spontaneously worship. It's not that God, you know, is egotistical and is sitting up there going, worship me. I demand that you worship me. Worship is a spontaneous expression of love and all. You've experienced that when you've been someplace that just was so awe-inspiring that it took your breath away or heard a piece of music that was so awe-inspiring that it just uh, took you to a, a higher level. You've been there where uh, you're, you're, you've gazed into the eyes of a newborn baby and, and just spontaneously love flows out of you. But when we see God as God really is, nobody has to tell us to worship. It just, the love just automatically flows in response. Uh, verse 21, in the same way, Moses sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, Almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Uh, the end of verse 22 is one of those um, verses that um, I, I would put on the list as um, among the, the most uh, wrongfully quoted in the Bible. How many times have you heard people say, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins? Uh, that's not what it says. It says, under the law. Almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Under the law, there's no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. Under the law, animals had to be sacrificed. That's the point that he's making here in Hebrews. What he's saying is contrary, and contrary to that, is that grace, under grace, there's forgiveness for all who call upon Jesus. Jesus doesn't have to be sacrificed again and again and again and again. One sacrifice on the cross, on that hill called Golgotha, roughly 2,000 years ago, is sufficient to take away all sin, all iniquity, all transgression, to remove it eventually out of the entire cosmos and out of every being within the cosmos. 
For Christ, verse 24, did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself again and again as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood that is not his own. For then he would have had to have suffered again to suffer again and again since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to remove sacrifice, to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. God in Christ has appeared to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for mortals to die once and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Jesus is coming again. And why is he coming again? Not to deal with sin. He's not coming in judgment. He's not mad at the world. <laughs> He's coming to save those who, eager, who are eagerly waiting for him. And we will go forth and escort him back here to his throne. So, once and for all, Jesus died for us. On Good Friday, though nobody much knew it then, it took a while for them to catch on. They needed Easter Sunday to start to catch on. But in reality, everything changed on Good Friday. The entire universe shifted there was there was a change in the cosmos there was a, uh, a a a universal change that took place jesus absorbed in himself all the sin all the iniquity all the transgression in the entirety of all creation paid the penalty for it poured out his precious divine holy blood willingly out of love for us. Therefore, sin is off the table. You have been forgiven. God has forgotten your sin, erased it out of his own mind. It will never be brought up again. You're never going to stand before God and have God bring out a list of all the stuff you've done wrong. That's not going to happen. There's no courtroom scene for you. You are God's child, and when you take your last breath on earth, you're going to simultaneously be taking your first breath in heaven, and the first person, the first thing you're going to see, I'm pretty sure, is Jesus. And he's going to be smiling at you, and he's going to say something like, well done, you good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Enter now into the joy of your Lord. And I imagine he's going to throw his loving arms around you and hold you tight. And then you're going to be reunited with all your loved ones that have gone on before. And you're going to meet all these cool people, you know, like Peter and Paul and James and all the rest of them, you know. Uh, what a What a fellowship. What a time. And then you're going to be with Jesus when heaven comes to earth and righteousness covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. When all the satanic forces are utterly, completely, and forever defeated. And the entire cosmos is completely restored. Love divine love, agape love, touching, surrounding, filling everything and everyone. Ah, Lord God, praise you, bless you. Thank you, Lord, that in these tumultuous times, we have the assurance that you win. God wins. Love wins. For God is love. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Amen.